People of God, receive the call to worship from Psalm 100. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For beloved congregation, our help is in the name of Jehovah God. He's made the heavens and the earth, and he has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb and sealed us with his Holy Spirit. Let us receive God's blessing by a true and living faith. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue now in our worship in song number 114. Praise waits for thee in Zion. Let's sing all the stanzas 114. It is our custom at this time, and we believe it's a godly one to read now from the law of God. We read through this law of God, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, regularly in this congregation, and to remind us of our sins and of our need for Jesus. The law also serves as this wonderful guide of thanks, and we pray that we may be guided into such things, the knowledge of such things as our sins and miseries of our Savior and of the way of godly service as we read together now, and not merely out of custom, certainly not out of superstition, but with the contemplation. Uh, We read the law of God together. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and Deuteronomy records the second giving of the law publicly to Israel as it was on the plains of, of Moab about to enter into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 5, the covenant God reminds this second generation of Israelites that had been brought out of Egypt, this new generation, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And the first commandment that the Lord gives there, reminding the people this second time, and us also, You shall have no other gods before me. Amazing how he begins the law there. How few remember that this is the first commandment. Jesus will tell us that this involves loving God. And here 
something we need to be reminded of. Also, right now in this house, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. In this third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant, your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And here's the incentive that's given in this second public giving of the law. The incentive for New Testament Sabbath keeping, entering the rest of God in a special day. Remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And you had no rest in your sins. That's the idea. You had no rest. You were a slave in the land of Egypt, and or, or but the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This comes to all children, young and old. Fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. That's the eighth commandment. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and you shall not desire your neighbor's house. His field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything. That is, your neighbors. May the Lord impress us, impress us truly, with this wonderful, holy law. And let's remember that in the New Testament, Jesus doesn't do away with the law. He fulfills it, gives it all its meaning. And so many other things could be said about that, but he gives it certainly its meaning when he says, here's the law, love your God with all your heart, with all your mind all your strength, with all your soul, everything that's within you, you owe to God and you ought to be dedicating to God in service and love and adoration. And then this, proof that you love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so may the Lord bless us as we hear his word, the covenanted people which gathers together in worship and thanks and praise. Let's sing now in response to the reading of thy, the law of God, number 66 in the Blue Psalter hymnals, 66 in thy wrath and hot displeasure. And the psalmist here is wrestling with his own sin and how God is dealing with it. In thy wrath and hot displeasure, he says in Psalm 38, and this is a versification of it, of course, chasten not thy servant, Lord. Let thy mercy without measure help and peace to me afford. Let's, uh, let's have the same spirit of the psalmist, shall we not, as we, as we sing this. 1, 3, 4, 7, and 8, 66.
find it amazing as you read through the Psalms, the sensitivity of that spiritual man of God, those men of God who were moved to write of their own soul searching and soul struggling. That's uh, it's amazing, really, that someone could be so sensitive to his own and to her own sin. I dare say, don't you, that's what we need to be, sensitive to our own sins, stirred up by the standard of holiness, reminded that we don't keep the commandments of God as we ought, not at all. Especially when God says, love me, love me with everything you have and are. Love that neighbor, that sinful neighbor as yourself. That's where it hits, doesn't it? And the Lord bless us with the knowledge that even though there's a struggle, and for all of those who really struggle with sin, there's a song. There's a thousand songs. There's a song, and the song wins. The song of victory. The song of the Spirit, as we celebrate today. The Spirit of Jesus Christ, in whom there is forgiveness. In that Spirit, let's now pray. Our Heavenly God and Father, it is a great privilege to enter your house and to meet truth here. Special way, special time, special place. Right now, your appointed New Testament solemnity, the hour of worship and prayer. And called we are by you, Lord, assemble together and forsake not that assembly of the sacred people of God in the sacred name of Jesus, according to ordinances you have decreed and ordained, and which are special means of grace. Here we are, Father, seeking your blessing, not in ourselves or because of anything we are or do or say or have done. It's all about your Son, Lord. This is his day. This is the day in which you confirmed his authenticity and that he is the way and the truth and the life. He's now risen to your right hand. And we believe this and are sure with all our hearts. And so we praise you. We praise you, we adore you, and we take not your name in vain, but we cling to that name you've given among sons of men, the name Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless us poor and burdened sinners with the knowledge that as we come to you in his name and as we trust in his name, in his identity, in his atoning work, as we come in his spirit, as we wrestle against sin, remind us, Lord, there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. They knew it long ago, psalmists and prophets and priests and kings, the people of God, and, and now especially we have the Spirit poured out, and so we ought to know that, that there is forgiveness. It's established. It's accomplished through the blood of Jesus and that there is this wonderful redemption accomplished and applied in the Spirit. We ought to know this, and we do. Lord, we do. In our heart of hearts, this is what we know. Oh, though we know our terrible sins, we know our guilt and shame that we mount up daily, except there be a mediator. Nevertheless, we know the song, Moses and the Lamb. And we know the sovereignty of the one to whom is given all power and authority at your right hand. And we know that he opens the seal of the counsel of your redemption, that great book. And you cause your counsels to come to pass. You save your own. And here we are. Father in heaven, we would worship you in spirit and in truth in the name of Jesus in the other side of the cross in the empty tomb and of the ascension in this age of the spirit. 
We pray, Father, move us and quicken us and fill us with your Spirit now. And we pray that devils may flee and that there may be this kissing of the Son here by faith, true and living faith of the congregation, your members, and all those who visit who have the same Spirit and who confess the same faith and who seek the same thing, the glory of God. Bless, we pray, your servant. May he bring the word. He have the spirit, the anointing, the ordination, and the qualification that's so necessary to bring the word. We pray that we may be glad and filled with gladness as a congregation. You have blessed us so richly with the opportunity to shine as a light here in northeast Grand Rapids and in many places beyond as you give us to minister. Bless us, Lord, in our communion. May there be nothing that separates us not only from your love, but from one another. May we be drawn nigh to you and each other in prayer every day. May it be that as we visit with one another, we're glad and we come together to encourage us and our little ones and the young people. We pray, even as we do, with great gladness of heart, you are blessing us here beyond what we could ask or think. Indeed, comparatively to the next Mega church down the road or this or that other institute, we are as nothing. And yet, Father, we despise not the day of small things, for you are beginning your great work here in this church, now church, and officially established, but among the people of God, your living body of Jesus. We pray, Father, continue to bless us with comfort from your word as we travel through this way, and there are pains. And there are hurts. Continue to bless us with the friendship that you show in your covenant embrace. And for all of those who are lonely and need friends in special ways now, we pray touch their hearts. And may, the, may they know the friendship of God. For sinners, we pray, give the blessing of repentance. For us, Lord, who are insensitive dolts by nature and who are imbeciles, Indeed, according to our Adamic nature, we pray, give sensitivity to our own need of Jesus every day. I mean, we never take for uh, granted that we need him every day. We pray, Father, for a reality about our faith that shows itself in fruitfulness, in growing and in reaching out, so that we are not here to circle wagons merely, to defend the faith and to be defended by you. But we are here even to, to assail the portals of hell itself and reaching out and, and being all things to all men to, that we might win some without compromise so that they may be brought up to, to the people of God and the God of the people, to, to the city on the great the, the hill in the midst of this world. Bless us, Lord as individuals, as families, those married without children, those with one or 10 or 15, however many you give. Bless us, Lord, in this solemn and sobering but also glad work of raising up a covenant seed. God be with us, and when there's fruit, may we rejoice. And when there's progress in faith among our own families, may we be glad, and may we see that you work even through sinful means of parents. Bless the elders, the deacons, the pastor, the officials of the church. Bless us with humility and grace, and bless us all, Father, who are members of the body here, who may be visiting as well. We may be conscious of the fact that you pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, not just certain dignitaries, but upon all flesh, so that every believer, if he be a true believer or she a true believer, is to be filled with the Spirit, to be showing evidences of the grace of God in this desert land, this world. Hear our prayers. Lord, we pray, vouchsafe to us a bit of heaven in the glories of your Son, that we may glory in you and boast in the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. And for your people everywhere, gather them, Lord, and defend and preserve them by your Spirit poured out your word inscripturated and declared, your word and your spirit in the hearts of that company of your people, for Christ's sake. 
Amen. We worship the Lord now in the giving of our offering to the general fund of this church. May God bless us as we would seek to support the ministry of the word. Let's take our Psalter hymnals at this time and turn to 95, versification of Psalm 51, in which the psalmist prays that the Lord would not take his spirit from him, striking prayer. But we, we sing this in the light of the New Testament and the spirit poured out. The, the, the first three stanzas, 95.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the New Testament in the book of Acts, in chapter 2. Another custom of many a church is to follow the so-called church calendar and to reflect upon the various great events, redemptive events that uh, occurred in history and which to us have great significance as the people of God, whether it's Friday, a good Friday, we celebrate and remember in a special way the crucified Savior, whether it's Resurrection Sunday, the Resurrection of the Savior, or Ascension Day. Here we are privileged, really, to reflect upon Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of Jesus was poured out. And again, not simply because it's following a certain calendar. Uh, Christianity is timeless. We know that. And we celebrate Pentecost every day. But we are spoken to in time. And God has done his mighty works in time. And he shall do that also in this age and at the end of time. So not a bad idea, not only, but a good thing from time to time, to reflect in a special way upon these great events. Acts 2, we would read of Pentecost and then hear God speak to us of that event. Let's read the first 21 verses. I read from the New King James Version. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, the disciples and their, their friends, were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, be about nine o'clock. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thus far we read, but if you're sensing my excitement about this text, I'd like to go on, maybe you would too. Let's uh, perhaps reflect upon these things in our homes afterwards, the rest of Acts chapter 2. Don't have time at this point, except to preach to you from verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven 
as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Thus far we read the sacred word of God. May the Lord bless us through the reading of it. You ever wonder what was in the minds of those people there who were in this upper room, apparently, in Jerusalem, according to the commandment of Jesus? He had said, you go to Jerusalem and you wait for the promise that I've made to you and will give to you. You wait for the promised spirit. That's what Jesus had said to them in his last day with them. In when he was ascended from them into glory. And with that knowledge, they're now waiting. And they have been waiting. It's very hard to get into the mind of these disciples. And just imagine that, children, their Savior Jesus had left them, not abandoned them, but maybe some were thinking that in their little faith. Jesus never abandons people, but um, that's what they're thinking, maybe. And... Not only that, but there's no spirit. There's no Holy Spirit yet. So there's no Jesus and there's no Holy Spirit. And you can imagine, for example, that that Sabbath and then that Sunday between the Ascension and this day, this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, and that Sunday between the Ascension and this Pentecost day, And they were called to worship God, but there's no Jesus, and there's no spirit yet. And theologians have pondered this. I'm not just coming up with this on my own, this this idea that maybe we should be thinking about that. Because that day, that day of worship then, was absent from the mediator and the spirit in whom we worship today. Can you think of that? You think of that loneliness, perhaps they may have felt or, or whatever, such that it's been called the Orphan Sunday. The Sunday in between when Jesus ascended and when the Spirit's poured out has been called that Orphan Sunday, the Sunday when God's people themselves didn't know their sonship by the spirit of adoption, we could say. They didn't have Jesus in person and the Spirit wasn't poured out. What a rather lonely day or something unusually empty maybe on that day, be that as it may, the waiting on this day as we read of this in Acts 2. And suddenly, suddenly, there's this sound, not a wind, children. It's it's a sound of a rushing, mighty wind. And then all of these signs of something that's going on here that certainly had not occurred the prior Sunday or ever. A sign of something, signs of something, the multiplication of them, as it were. And this sound is from heaven, and these signs are evidently from heaven. They're not from hell, and they're not from over there in some other land. They're from heaven. And so they're moved here at this time. What a great, great day for the New Testament church. And and that's why we think about this in special ways, at special times even, as a church. Because do you know this? Without this day, there would be no birthday of the New Testament church. This is the New Testament church's birthday not the birthday of the church altogether. We believe there was a church in the, in the wilderness, too, in the Old Testament, among the people of God. But here's the New Testament church's birthday. Without the Spirit, there is no such birth of the New Testament church. Besides that, couldn't have the apostles going off, as we read in the rest of the book of Acts, with the enlightenment of the Spirit and the anointing of the Spirit telling them what Jesus was all about, after all. They wouldn't have the boldness, the intelligence, the understanding as they did after the Spirit was poured out. As we read even when Peter gets up and preaches 
the significance of the song. And so it's, it's well for us to gather here together. And also, not to be a little bit uh, in wonder as to how we as ourselves can experience this, because it's for us even to experience something of this Pentecost even today. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, we're going to read of this great event. But it, you see, it's not like a circus event here that we're looking at in the book of Acts. No, it's astounding, and everybody is amazed. It's, it's a salvific event, something that has to do with salvation. Salvation and Pentecost that are fully come, and they are meant to be experienced and realized in New Testament ways by us today, even, for example, as we worship in spirit and in truth, and as we seek to bear fruit of the Holy Spirit poured out in our lives and as a congregation. So let's consider Pentecost with an exclamation point, and then first of all that it's fully come, the day of Pentecost had fully come. I believe there's significance to that. And secondly, that it is fabulously signified. And then finally, that they are filled one and all. As we read in the book of Acts here, they are filled with, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues and so on. So Pentecost fully come, fabulously signified, and filled one and all. The day of Pentecost was one of the three annual feast days that was celebrated in Israel according to the ceremonial uh, law of God. And the day of Pentecost was significant in that it symbolized even the gift of God's provision of and for his people of the Holy Spirit. That's something we need to remember here. The gift of the Holy Spirit was signified in Pentecost itself. Let's just get into that a little bit as we explore and examine the types and the shadows of the Old Testament. Pentecost was a day of harvest. And it was a special day, as I said, in Israel. And a special day in which barley loaves, two of them, would be waved over the altar in the temple and that to consecrate the whole harvest that was being gathered in and the loaves that were being made, uh, to consecrate them in thanks to God. He provided for them. But now, Pentecost is one of those feasts, also called the Feast of Harvest, which also gained its significance from what it was connected to in the calendar of Israel. And it was connected to the Feast of Passover, the Passover feast had taken place some 50 days before that, hence the name Pentecost, 50 days after one of the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that was celebrated after uh, the Passover. The Passover children, you know, was a symbol or this celebration in, of Israel of God's having passed over the people of God when they were in Israel, or in, excuse me, in Egypt, and when they had killed a lamb, the lamb's blood was poured on the doorposts of the people of God's houses, and the angel of death in Egypt passed over their houses who were covered with the blood of the lamb and slew instead the firstborn of all of the households in Egypt who were not covered by the blood of the lamb. The angel of death on that, on that bloody night passed over Israel, and God showed his mercy to his people and began to call them out. Well, that's Passover. Pentecost, I say, is connected with the Passover. It's the 50th day after one of the days of the Passover feast. Let's put that together, and here's where you can see why I'm saying that Pentecost was symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit that God would give to Israel. How is it? So significant because of what we know about the Passover, undoubtedly. What do we know? What do these students of the word here in this congregation know about what the Passover symbolized? I think even some of the youngest in the congregation would know that. The Passover symbolized what? Jesus' shedding of his blood. 
the blood of that lamb, who is now our Passover, Paul says in Corinthians, who is shed, whose blood is shed for our sins. Beautiful, beautiful. So Israel was reminded of that every time they celebrated the Passover annually, and as well with all of the, uh, the other offerings. But in that particular way, it was a wonderful thing. And so it's significant that God at that time in the Passover feast also had the waving of sheaves of barley. It was the beginning of the barley harvest at the Passover time. So Pentecost celebrates something else that's given after Jesus is giving, given. And because he's given, even the Holy Spirit. Here's how. The Lord Jesus, we know, is given for our salvation. We believe that as a Christian church. He's given, and there's blood through his atonement. He's come. And the disciples who are waiting uh, there at, at, on Jerusalem, they understood something of this. Jesus had to die for sins. But more than that, here's what we need. We need, as a people of God, the application of that blood to us. The giving of that Christ to us. And that's the significance of the Holy Spirit and of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Passover's blood is shed. That's the beginning of the barley harvest. The sheaves are waved over the altar. Then, 50 days later, there is this fullness of the harvest. It's being brought in, signifying that all that Passover lamb was for us is now given to us and we can appropriate him. We can eat him as we eat bread and we can drink him as we drink in water. He's our life. And so you see, Passover there, 50 days later with this Pentecost feast, meant everything to Israel of the provision of God. And it means everything to us, as it signified then. We have redemption, accomplished and applied. Redemption, salvation from sin and guilt and, and depravity and the bondage of Egypt. Deliverance from that scary land of Adam. And it's now made good to us personally as we appropriate these things by faith and as the Spirit of Christ is poured out so that now we know that this Jesus of whom we read and whom we see typified is mine. We know that, don't we? That's everything for the church. Jesus, and now not something that's different that, than Jesus altogether, but Jesus himself given to us in the Spirit. That's the purpose of our understanding of Pentecost. It's the celebration of Jesus who's gone up with a shout into glory personally and, and physically, but is now with us as he promised to the end of time in the Spirit. Not all of this is pictured here. And all of this we ought to celebrate and we'll see how presently. But at that time and up to that time, that Pentecost had not yet fully come. And I believe that it's not just a mention here of the fact that it wasn't quite, it was 49 days after the Passover, but I think there's a broader application. It hadn't fully come ever, I think is the point. It hadn't really been understood and realized ever. Why? Because Jesus hadn't come. The real Passover had not been slain, and the real Holy Spirit had not been poured out upon all flesh. Well, in the Old Testament, Let's be clear on this. There was the Holy Spirit. We read of, in Psalm 51, we sang a versification of Psalm 51. The psalmist says, take not your spirit from me. And we know the psalmist is forgiven. There is forgiveness with God that you may be feared, Psalm 130. Forgiveness is through Jesus and applied in his spirit. And people knew back then their salvation. 
And you can only know God in the Spirit of God, in, in the knowledge that he gives who searches the deep things of God, as the Holy Spirit does. Well, so that having been said, however, in a very real way, the fullness of the Spirit was not yet, was not yet given. John 7, Jesus reminds us of that. He was speaking of water that he would give, and John comments, this he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, however, was not yet, according to the Bible, not yet given is the idea, because that Jesus wasn't glorified. So, Pentecost, fully come, occurs when Jesus dies, the Passover lamb is slain, and the blood is applied to the doorposts, and when Jesus rises and receives the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as Peter will speak of in Acts 2, and pours it out upon all flesh. And only then is the Spirit of the Christ poured out upon God's people so that we can taste and see and eat the bread of life signified in those barley loaves waved over the altar. Fully come. And fully enjoyed by the people of God, what an advancement over the Old Testament. Oh, we don't appreciate that enough. <clears throat> Jesus says, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven, New Testament, greater than those who are in the Old Testament. Greater how? Because we have greater knowledge of God. We know Jesus personally in this wonderful communion of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament... The people of Israel were like babies, or at least children who were not yet mature. They needed pictures on the walls. They needed prophets and representatives. They needed priests and kings and so on. But, but now the Spirit is poured out. And there's this great understanding by the Spirit who enlightens us of the things of God, as Jesus himself said, he will teach you of all things concerning me. So that everyone now, from knee high to a grasshopper to 95, who is in the Spirit, knows God in a wonderful way. I was about to say fantastic and fabulous way, but it's real. And we need not that anyone teach us, even though God gives teachers in the church. Fundamentally, we are taught of the Lord. And our children, as many as God will call, are taught of the Lord. And when they say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, it's real. More could be said. What about the fabulous signification of all of this? Three signs, but two more, at least, that are often forgotten. The three outstanding ones of this day, a sound of a rushing, mighty when just the sound fills the whole house where they were sitting. The sound. You know, children, it must have sounded like a locomotive train or a plane or something. Imagine that sound. The sound impressed them. The hearing of that day. They were hearing something just amazing. They weren't moved about at that time, but it was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I believe this, this is a sign of something, a sign of the Spirit who's poured out, in fact. In fact, uh, no doubt here, we're, we're led to, to Jesus' words in John 3 to Nicodemus, the Spirit blows where he wills. The Spirit is like a wind, blows where he wills. And the idea there is that the Spirit cannot be resisted. He's like a hurricane, tornado, whatever you want to call him. He just blows, and everybody uh, who doesn't get out of the way is blown over by the Holy Spirit. He's sovereign. and so important for us to remember as believers that God is sovereign in salvation. Some will say, yes, God was sovereign in giving Jesus, and in Jesus dying for our sins. We couldn't have done that. But they compromise when they get to the Spirit's application of salvation, and they say, well, we have to do something then to maybe earn the Spirit or to get filled with the Spirit or to 
go through some hoops or whatever in order to be in favor with God when it comes to the application of the Spirit. Not so according to this sign here. The Spirit blew like a rushing, mighty hurricane force, F infinity. The power of God in the Spirit. And that's what the Spirit does in salvation. He blows where he will. He causes to be regenerated whom he will among the dead in trespasses and sins in this uh, wasteland of an earth that it is. Amazing. The sovereignty of the Spirit of God redeeming us, applying it as well to our account. It's all of God and all of grace. Yes, sovereign grace is represented here. Secondly, mysterious grace. Let's never uh, just flippantly consider Pentecost, shall we? Or the new birth, or the Spirit's work in our life to give us repentance when we were stubborn for so long. It's mysterious, isn't it? Mysterious in its power, mysterious in, well, the question, why God would save me? Why God would blow me away once again by this understanding that he's given to me that I had so long not been able to see? There's a mystery here. And so, yes, there's this proper way in which Christianity is mystical, And the proper way is that we are those who don't have all the answers, though we have the fundamental ones by the grace of God. There's this mystery, there's this adoration, and there ought to be in worship so that we come together and it's not merely perfunctory. That means automatic, children. It's not a formalism. It's a meeting with God in the Spirit. And when you meet with God in the Spirit... And when you preach and when you hear in the Spirit, there ought to be this shaking and this moving because you're hearing something of the sound of the rushing mighty wind of God and He's doing something as only He can do. And so there's this sovereignty, this mystery. Some have even suggested that the rushing of the wind is a sound that the Heavenly Father, through the mediation of His Son, was rushing to claim His own. Not hesitating, not wanting them to be orphans any longer. Rushing, rushing to their aid. Rushing to that forlorn church. Rushing to those sinners. As God does in His time. Not as we rush, in a helter-skelter sort of way, but in a holy rush. Amazing uh, expediency and quickness of the Heavenly Father. We move on. Signs of the tongues of fire. Just to say that fire is symbolic of, of God, the Holy God, and His Holy Spirit. You have Him speaking to Moses in a burning bush. You have Jesus or John saying that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. Well, fire is cleansing, and fire is the significance of, of those who are cleansed from all sins. The, the angels even, a class of angels in, in the Bible, the seraphs are the burning ones, Isaiah 6. They burn with zeal. That's another idea of fire. They burn, and they are those who are on fire for God, and they would have this energy directed to God and would that our young people's energy and our children's energy would be directed to God so we're on fire for God but as we'll see of course it's not a wild fire it's a fire of the word of God but it's a fire and an energy nonetheless and so you have the the, the tongues there I, I can move on more could be said about this but now the speaking the, the tongues of fire the speaking of tongues as um, here is is an amazing gift as well, manifest in other parts of the church as well. In the years following that, especially Corinth had the, the, uh, the tongues speaking uh, of the Spirit. And here they were speaking in tongues, glossolalia, uh, in, in their own language, known languages, so that all these people coming from Pentecost, from the diaspora, the scattered ones, the Jews of all the nations, and the proselytes were there, And they were all hearing each other speak in his own language. 
At this point in the catechism lesson, I'd start speaking in foolish gibberish or even known tongues like French and German and Hebrew and so on, and I wouldn't impress the kids so much. I'd confuse them because they couldn't understand it. But in this pulpit, I would like to remind you that they could understand each other, and I don't think it was just that the Cretans could understand um, others in Cretan languages, but they couldn't understand others who were speaking in Arabian to other languages. I think they all understood each other. That's what I'm trying to say. They all understood each other so that if you were a Cretan, you could understand an Arabian, and if you were from Parthia or whatever, you could understand those of Jerusalem. It was all this amazing unity of language, seemingly the reversal of Babel. Also a picture of what it's going to be like in heaven. No national barriers. The union and communion of the saints typified here. In fact, that they're brought from all the nations signifies the universality, the true Catholicity of the Church of Christ right here. It's from every nation, tribe, and tongue that God saves his own. So that, as Joel prophesies, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you have those gifts there, signifying what they do. And um, I'm not going to speak at this time of tongues, and whether that's for today, I don't believe it is. Note here, these people didn't seek the gift of tongues. They were given it. Many people today seek the gift of tongues, but the Bible presents it uh, in most cases as a gift of God. And we have the whole New Testament written, and so many things could be said to, uh, to prove, I believe, without a doubt, the veracity of the cessationist position that the gift of tongues is not for today. It was for then to confirm the word of God and to lead the people in the foundation of the New Testament church. But I want to say two other things that are forgotten. Pentecost is is known for these three gifts and this astounding, astounding sound of a wind, fire on the heads of these 120, and the amazing gift of tongues. It's known for that. It's known for that in many, of a, church, in many a church as the things that were what Pentecost was all about. Well, we need to know what I believe is the most important fruit of Pentecost, the, the important sign of the Holy Spirit. It was this. It was Peter standing up. And it was Peter, Peter, who was opposing those who were mocking the Spirit-filled believers as if they were drunk. Peter, it was. Bold Peter, now enlightened Peter, raising his voice and saying to the men of Judea and all who dwelt in Jerusalem the truth of Pentecost. It was Peter who was the one now given the Spirit in a huge way to move him to understand Joel for once and to understand Isaiah the prophet for once and to understand now fully what Passover was about and its connection with Pentecost was about. Peter was given the Holy Spirit to preach. And the rest of the book of Acts is the Spirit-inspired men, the Spirit-enlightened men, preaching Christ crucified, risen, and the Spirit of Jesus poured out now in this fullness of time. That's the great wonder of Pentecost. Light from heaven with the sound from heaven. The utterance of the Spirit that filled the gospelers with gospel and the believers with ears, including, of course, his call to repentance of the Jews. The call to the men of Israel who had slain the Savior to repent as the only way of salvation included that. And it's included today in the gospel message. We must repent of our sins against the Savior and believe on him. Pentecost. 
And then the fifth sign, the church. You read the Acts, the, the end of the book of Acts, you have this church, amazing church that's gathered out of the people who are pricked in their hearts at the preaching of Peter. And there's 3,000 that are gathered together and they're gathered together around the, the word of God. And they're gathered together and, and, they're, and they're worshiping God and they're gathered together and it's, it's amazing so that the Lord is adding to them such as should be saved daily. What a church, what a great Pentecostal church at that day. The birthday of the church. So much more, again, could be said about that. I move on to my final point about the, the filling. You read here in Acts 2, that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I believe that's um, significant in that it points us to what Pentecost and its significance ought to look like in our lives today. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that's the norm for us. We ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? It means dominated by God's presence in Jesus poured out now in His Spirit. Dominated. So that not just your belly is full of the Spirit, but your hands are full of the Spirit. Your heart, your mind's enlightened. Your thoughts, your desires, they're all moved by God now. By God, in light of Passover, in light of Pentecost, in light of the end of time. It's all about God when God takes over and fills us. And any crevice or any crack in us, any corner of our existence that's not filled by the Spirit, well, that's remaining sin, that's indwelling sin and sin having its way, and dominating us. It has to be rooted out like weeds in a garden and in its place, the presence of the Holy Spirit. These were all filled there, filled. And we need to be reminded that this is to be the norm, I believe, for us. Spirit-filled people. Now, just three ways I want to suggest to you, because it's biblical, but I suggest to you that this text is leading us to learn how to be filled. First of all, be filled with the Spirit is to wait on God. It's to wait on God. And to be filled in the Spirit, therefore, is to trust in God. Now, the, the disciples, let's get the setting here again. They were waiting on God. They were waiting on God to do what Jesus had said he would do. Wait there. Just wait there. Wait on God. Trust me. I'm going away. I'm going away for a little while, but however long it is, children, wait. Yesterday at a graduation of my son. I told him to wait on the Lord. And I told him that that's what young men need to know. To wait on the Lord. We're always rushing. Always rushing. And... You don't learn so well from your dad or your mom, especially your dad, about waiting. You need to learn from God. He says it. Even if it's hard, wait. Wait. Don't rush. Wait. Be wise. Be wise in life. Wait on the Lord. How often the Bible's urging us to this activity. That's an activity, you know. Wait. Don't just sit there. It's just wait. It's waiting. Wait, wait, wait for an answer from heaven. Trust in God when nobody else can be trusted. Wait in your decisions in life, schooling, mates, your loves, your hates. Wait for God. Trust in him. Don't go ahead. Wait. wait. That's all. That's what they're doing here. And it's my opinion that the disciples not wait or waiting was very imperfect, and that was proven even by the fact that they, they didn't wait to call another disciple. 
There's difference of opinion on that, but Acts 1, the end of it, shows them casting their lots and they choose Matthias, and we never read of Matthias anymore, but we do read of the Apostle Paul, whom God gave in his time, to be the twelfth. I think they weren't waiting so much. Again, we can differ on that, but there's an instance there what I believe that the disciples weren't waiting. But here they are at Pentecost. They're waiting for the Spirit. Wait, wait, wait for the Spirit. All right, secondly, there's going to be a word about us, a word. For all the waiters and for all those who want to be in the Spirit, hear this. We cannot be in the Spirit of Christ and be filled with the Spirit of Christ without the Word of Christ. Here's where so many go astray. And they say they're Spirit-filled even. And they say they're so Spirit-filled that they're more Spirit-filled than you are. The problem is they don't have the Word. Well, they have it, kind of. And they, they skim through it, sort of. But there's gospel light in many a congregation's preaching. There's a little bit of gospel and not a lot of the Word of God. There's a little bit of doctrine, and not a lot, or at least very little, so that we don't offend people or bore them, because after all, doctrine's dry. People of God, where the Spirit is, the Word is. Where the Word is, there must be the Holy Spirit, enlightening our intelligence and our life in the light of the Word. They go hand in hand. Martin Luther would say even to those who, had the, who said they had the Spirit, but they didn't have the truth of God, he would say to them, I smite your spirit on the snout. Because any spirit without the Word of God, any spirit that's Christless, is really not from heaven, but from hell. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of the Word of God. The Word of God that we know as the Word of God revealed in the Bible and the doctrines of the Bible. Let's always remember that if we would be filled with the Spirit personally and as a congregation. So wait and be Word-centered and then may it lead to worship. Worship. And that's exactly what it led to on Pentecost, the birthday of the New Testament church. Whatever other fruits of the Holy Spirit we must have, read of them in Galatians and read of them in the entire New Testament. This is principle. Worship the Lord. Worship and come and bow down and kneel before the presence of God. It's something, you see, that has to do with reverence and adoration that we need to be having in the church and for the church to be rekindled in its devotion to God you see, the Spirit is not given, first of all, that we might be happy and maybe laughing even in church. We're so happy. Indeed, the Spirit is the comforter. But the Spirit is, first of all, to lead us on our knees to reverence God in the name of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not, hey, you're going to feel better about yourselves if you're here. It is about worship, worship of the living God, no matter how we feel, frankly. Worship. Praise Him. Adore Him. That's what heaven's like. Let's have a bit of heaven now. So you got these three W's, don't we? Waiting, word, worship. And I'm hinting here at a hindrance to being filled with the Spirit. And I want to point that out to all of us as one of the many problems of being Spirit-filled in this age. The Internet. www.idiot is really what it ought to be described as for many. Nothing wrong with the Internet. Nothing wrong with technology. Nothing wrong with the media. But let's remember, folks, the mediator, Jesus. Let's remember wisdom. Let's remember knowledge that's deep and knowledge that's not just a mile wide and an inch deep. No lot of facts. But let's remember the mediator. How can we wait if we're in such a rush to get the latest email we haven't checked in five minutes? How can we wait on the Lord and worship the Lord if we're so interested in, in knowing the latest fact from Benghazi or wherever else? 
Again, balance and focus is so important in life. May the Lord bless us. Pentecost is fully come. In such a time as this, people of God, what shall we be doing? How shall we be filled? What shall be motivating us and our families and our witness? May God empower us and enlighten us and encourage us in the Holy Spirit poured out, the Holy Spirit of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you that you would bless us this morning with your word. We confess our littleness and your greatness, and we pray that we may be more spirit-filled and more empty of ourselves, that we can worship you more and more and increasingly as the day of your coming is evident and the day of your coming is known. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 402 glorious things of thee are spoken. <coughs> Let's sing one and three, the first and the third of 402. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.